Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> I have a hard act to follow this morning after these two excellent lectures that we've already heard. And I have to admit that I'm, um, I'm very much an applied mathematician. My own background is in fluid mechanics. Um, and uh, you'll find in a way that the notations that I use are, are will appear very, very old fashioned. They're the notations that were some introduced by James Clark Maxwell, my great hero in the 19th century. And um, as far as um, fluid mechanics is concerned, these notations have turned out to be extremely useful and enduring. And uh, they are still very, the notation is very widely used in the literature of fluid mechanics, particularly in, in the journal that I uh, was an editor of for many years, the Jur Journal of Fluid Mechanics. So you'll have to bear with me if this is a notation that seems to you um, a little antiquated compared with the notations of the lecture that we have just uh, been privileged to, to um, hear. I'm sorry, this uh, slide seems to be a little bit small. I don't know why it, uh, it's this way. It's, uh, it's large enough on my screen. It should be uh, expanded, but I, I don't know how to do it. However, if it's legible at the back, that's the important thing. Um, so the topic really is not as they, as they uh, appear in the subject of fluid mechanics. And of course, you'll recognize these little diagrams as coming from Charain's knot plot. Um, and I put a little arrow on each of these um, ingredients here of a link, a triple link here, a double link, and here a single knot. But in each case, there's an arrow on each of the constituents. And um, the arrow, if that is interpreted as a, a vortex knot, then uh, there's a very definite reason for the arrow. It's an oriented knot. There is a direction of the vorticity field within the knot. Likewise, if it's interpreted as a magnetic knot in a conducting plasma, then the magnetic field, again, has a direction. So there's always a little arrow associated with these knot diagrams. Um, <coughs> the background here is um, actually taken from a direct numerical simulation of a turbulent flow, and it's, uh, I've made it deliberately faded, um, but it shows you the vorticity field in um, a high, what's called high Reynolds number, turbulent flow. And so you see an extremely complicated uh, three-dimensional configurations. Uh, but you can discern tube-like structures, and these tubes are definitely highly interlinked on the whole. And um, that concept of linkage of, of simple knots or links carries over to random fields of this kind. And it's uh, the concept context of turbulence th in fluid mechanics that we're very much concerned with. Um, now, I don't know how uh, to get to the, the next. If I press N here, it's, uh, it's not taking me there, and I'm not sure what the reason for that might be. Um, next. Oh, there we are, yes. I have to do it with the right hand rather than the left hand. <laughs> it's chiral, a, a chiral device. <laughs> um, yes, um, well, I'll show you this little picture of a, a vortex ring. This is one of, um, we've heard twice this morning about the experiments um, of uh, William Irvin in Chicago. Um, but um, I show you here, firstly, the picture of Euler, a little bit of, of the history of the subject. Euler, in uh, 1756, um, uh, produced the equations of ideal fluid mechanics, now known as the Euler equations. Of course, so many uh, things are named after the great Euler. But uh, these equations of fluid mechanics are very remarkable. They describe the evolution of a velocity field um, in an ideal fluid when all dissipative effects are neglected. And here is Helmholtz on the right uh, from this country, a great uh, fluid dynamicist and also physiologist, um, famous for his work in physiology also, Hermann von Helmholtz, who de derived the laws of vortex motion, a very, very important paper in 1858. Um, now, I hope this will function 
I haven't tested it out, but let's try. Um, uh, oh, it didn't function. Oh dear. Mm. We'll go back one. I'm not sure why. Oh yeah, nearly. Okay, previous. Ah, good, it is. It's just working. So this is actually just a, a, sync, a symbol, a simple circular vortex shed from the motion of a ring, and you're moving with the uh, ring, So the but the vortex is shed, and you can see that it more or less translates uh, quite stably. It's a nice, fairly stable structure, and it uh, moves off the screen there. Perhaps I can just show that again, but it might, um, yeah. Um, a little bit slow. No. There we go. I don't know if you can see uh, at the back, but th you see particles of fluid moving around the vortex, and it's these particles moving around that com that um, cause the vortex to translate. Every element of the vortex generates its vo velocity field, and it's that same velocity field that causes the translation of the vortex. Um, so uh, I ask you to note how the vortex apparently moves with the flow. And in a turbulent flow, vorticity, you can think of it as spin, if you like, the local spin of the fluid, is randomly distributed throughout the fluid, but still the vorticity tends to be convected with the flow. Okay. Um, and um, I just say here that uh, vortex rings do abound in nature. Uh, this is a wonderful photograph that was taken by Marco Fuli, the eruption of Mount Etna in uh, February 2000. It's quite a famous photograph, but it's an amazing vortex ring that was emitted like a great puff from the volcano. And this was a close up of the same, the same ring. And it survived for quite a long time as it, uh, uh, of course, uh, most of you are familiar with smoke rings, although we don't see them so often nowadays, but it used to be quite a common pursuit to blow smoke rings <laughs> the same principle exactly, you blow the smoke, uh, you create a vortex ring, and the smoke is carried with the vortex ring. And I used to be able to demonstrate that with um, my students in course in Cambridge University um, with what was called a Kelvin box, a box filled with smoke. And uh, you simply pat the back and there's an orifice and the vortex ring would propagate quite rapidly across the lecture room. Lecture room quite a bit bigger than this one. And it was remarkable. The students really saw that uh, vortex ring. We can't do it anymore now because it sets off the smoke alarm. <laughs> 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 um, well, um, uh, now, Similarly, this is a wonderful phenomenon that uh, dolphins create their own uh, vortex rings uh, by blowing bubbles through their little orifice. Uh, and um, they are air bubbles, but they're also vortex rings. Uh, and the bubbles are simply trapped in the vortex ring because the center of a, at the core of a vortex, you have a very low pressure. And the low pressure tends to attract any, any air bubbles that are in the vicinity. And so these air bubbles actually mark the vortex ring. You may be familiar with this uh, movie, which um, shows this quite uh, well. Um, let's see if this uh, will run. Can you see that at the back? Is that one clear? And it's wonderful. You see, they blow their <laughs> they blow the uh, their air bubble vortex ring, and then play with it. It's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it's quite quite uh, remarkable to watch this uh, this movie. This one was in a in an aquarium, but they seem to be very very intelligent animals. They learn very quickly how to blow the blow the bubbles, and then to play with them. And it's not only dolphins, um, but whales do the same thing. I think if I move on, 
I can show you the whole of that movie, but um, here's a, a whale. We'll let, let this run for a moment. Um, you've all seen this sort of picture, but I think um, we'll see a vortex ring in a moment. Um, at least I think we will. Are these people will? There it is. It is amazing. So the um, the whale again blows um, a ring which is a vortex ring and uh, with huge amount of bubbles that are trapped in it and of course it rises to the surface. This vortex ring erupts through the surface. There it goes again. Wonderful phenomenon. Highly turbulent of course. A highly turbulent vortex ring but um, that is what you're seeing there. Okay, well, let me go back to these uh, slides um, uh, and move on. Well, we've heard about a little about uh, the history this morning, but I'll say a little bit more. 1869, as I think you heard, or maybe perhaps 1867, his first paper on this, uh, uh, Kelvin, he was then William Thompson. We have this confusing situation in England whereby if you're uh, elevated to the to the House of Lords, then you can you change your name, you choose your name. He chose the name of Kelvin, which is uh, an, an area of uh, Glasgow where he was professor of natural philosophy. So Lord Kelvin posed a number of questions. Can vortices be knotted? and yet similarly retain their identity, like the circular vortex? Uh, the answer to that is yes, at least for a while, as we know now. At least for a while, not forever. Do they exist as stable solutions of the Euler equations of fluid mechanics? He hoped that they did, and he tried to find them for a long time. But alas, the answer to that question is no. And his third question, are the atoms of the elements of the periodic table knotted vortices in disguise? Again, he hoped that the answer was yes. That was his theory of vortex atoms. Um, the periodic table was published by Mendeleev that same year, 1869, and so it was obviously a very, very hot topic at the time. But the answer is no, as again, we now know. Um, this um, was uh, Thompson or Kelvin about that time when he was raising these fundamental questions. I, I owe this diagram to Renzo, who dug it out of the records of the Cambridge University Library, where there are Kelvin's notebooks and also Maxwell's uh, notebooks. So Renzo did a lot of research there. <laughs> I don't know how you managed to discover this, but there it is. This diagram just goes to show that um, uh, Kelvin was not a very good artist <laughs> <laughs> and his writing was pretty bad to his. But um, hi all this, uh, his work, of course, is published. And this is a page from his 1869 paper, which you can see that he is he is thinking in terms of uh, of knots and uh, links, the hop link, the trefoil, I think he's got the Borromean rings here, and so on. So various different possibilities he was uh, thinking about at that time. Um, and uh, here is Maxwell, who I'm so fond of, and being a, a fellow Scot. Um, he... Uh, he was also a, a fellow of Trinity College uh, in the 1850s for a very short time, actually, but he came back as the first professor of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, physics laboratory, in 1870, and he, he became an honorary fellow of Trinity. He couldn't become a fellow again because in 1870, if you were married, you could not be a fellow of a college. Uh, that changed during the 1870s. Um, but uh, uh, he, he remained an honorary fellow and died in uh, uh, 1879, uh, very young at the age of, I think he was 48. Tragic, really, because he was obviously at the height of his powers. And uh, as we all know, he really was a genius. And there's no knowing what he might have done if he had uh, lived uh, for a decade or two longer. But again, uh, here's a picture that Renzo found from... Uh, the libraries even got his um, Clark Maxwell signature on it. 
And uh, it shows also that his writing was rather bad and uh, <laughs> his style. But um, what is interesting is he shows the parametric equations of a knotted curve here. X equals sine 2 theta, Y equals sine 3 theta, Z equals sine 5 theta plus a parameter gamma, which can be varied. And as you vary gamma, you can get different uh, geometrical forms and actually different topologies, as he uh, realized. Well, this was amazing. He didn't publish this. It was in one of his letters, a letter to, to um, his friend, uh, colleague, um, Peter Guthrie Tate. And um, Maxwell just didn't bother to publish it. He, he did this sort of thing, scribbled a, a letter with some wonderful new ideas. And, uh, and that was it for him. He, he played with knots, but I don't think he really took them too, too seriously, unlike Kelvin, who, <laughs> who really was very, very committed to them. Um, so um, Maxwell's um, correspondence, fortunately, has now been, been published and edited. And uh, this is just the, the letter I showed you, letter to Peter Guthrie Tate, 1867, so it is just when uh, the year that uh, Kelvin was himself beginning to think about these things. It's interesting that Tate um, translated Helmholtz's paper, the 1858 paper. It appeared in English about, I don't know when, about 1865, and that's when uh, Tate and Kelvin got involved in it. And Tate produced um, smoke rings in his laboratory in Edinburgh, and Kelvin was in Glasgow, 40 miles away to the west, but uh, he went and visited, got very excited when Tate invited him over to see his vortex rings. So um, there in this uh, single letter to Tate, he's got these diagrams, the whitehead link, the Borromean rings, uh, and the trefoil knot, a right-handed trefoil knot, as it happens. He th here's the parametric equations. He distinguishes right-handed and left-handed knots and the business of chirality that we heard about this morning. He gives the parametric equations, and of course this can be generalized, and I think uh, Renzo will give you this in the tutorial this afternoon. We'll propose developments of this idea of representing not any knot through its parametric equations in general through a Fourier series. Obviously, it's got to be Fourier. If you take a parameter uh, round the knot, then you've, you've got to have a representation that's periodic in that parameter and therefore admits uh, a Fourier series. Um, and then, uh, yes, he has these, uh, th these uh, pictures of the knot as you vary this parameter gamma. Um, I'm still not sure. These, uh, uh, this is the unknot. And this is the um, uh, the seven crossing. Is it seven crossings? I think so. Um, and um, I think it's actually the same knot. Is it not? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that will come out in the, in the tutorial, no doubt, this afternoon. Um, um, Tate, in the meantime, was um, classifying the knots. This is one of the first uh, great classifications, and this is his table of knots of uh, ten crossings. It's amazing. He looks an extremely serious uh, man, very, very dedicated to his, uh, to, I mean, it, it must be an extraordinary work of dedication to, to work out uh, this table. He had his methods for doing it quite systematically, and I think there were one or just one or two errors in the, in the, in the whole table. One, one error. Is that right? A duplication. A, du a duplication, yes. Yeah. The perco pair, yeah. That's right, quite remarkable. Um, he was senior wrangler in 1852. That means he came top of the maths class in uh, the mathematical tripos, senior wrangler. And um, there was tremendous competition at that time to be senior wrangler, to become top. Of but he is alleged to have said, made this statement afterwards, that's nothing, he said. Uh, I could coach a coal scuttle to be a senior wrangler. Every undergraduate room in those days would have a coal scuttle, a container for coal, and open fire. It was the only heating in, in those days. He could coach his coal scuttle to be senior wrangler, <laughs> is what he said. Well, as a Tate was stimulated by Kelvin's vortex atom theory to initiate the classification of knots. Um, and uh, he got as far as 10 crossings. And I understand that um, it's now known 
that there are 1.7 million approximately no, uh, distinct prime knots of up to 16 crossings. Uh, you begin to wonder, is it worth going on with this? Um, okay, 17, 18 crossings. There are going to be more and more, but is it really worth classifying them? I don't know what your answer to that would be, Lou, but there's obviously going to be a limit to this. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Why not? Yes. <laughs> it uh, certainly Im employs um, PhD students, that's for sure. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, the trefoil knot, uh, the answer to the question, Kelvin's first question, can a vortex uh, be um, knotted, was um, answered experimentally by... Um, by by William Irvin and let's see if I can get this one to work. There it is. Yes, there's his um, his vortex knot. It's definitely knotted. If you he, he de deliberately stops it and rotates and views it from all angles to be absolutely sure that it it is knotted, and then the the movie continues and uh, it reconnects. It actually reconnects in three places, as you might expect from the triple symmetry of the trefoil knot. So there is a reconnection going on, and after the reconnection, it has split, if you uh, look at it closely, into two unlinked rings, two circles. And what is going on, I've tried to represent in this uh, very diagrammatically here. Here's the trefoil knot looked at and rather idealized. You can think of it as an inner circle and an outer cir circle. Uh, connected by these um, crossings. That is the trefoil knot, as I've drawn it. And uh, the inner loop propagates, tends to propagate more rapidly, because it goes like the curvature, uh, than the outer loop. So here's the inner loop propagating and stretching out these connecting strands. And they are connecting vortices, well, vortices that are uh, oppositely oriented and that's where the reconnections take place so you stretch they become more and more nearly anti-parallel and then viscosity intervenes and uh, reconnects these knots so the topology changes it changes through a diffusion process in this case so to begin with the vortex moves with the fluid it moves under its own self-induced velocity field. But when two strands come too close together, you might close together, then viscosity eliminates uh, the because they're plus and minus. Uh, it uh, causes the reconnection. And that is what you're seeing here. Okay. Um, next. The same for the Hopf link. Now I show you here because we'll be uh, no, no, there isn't. Well, we were partial solution. Yoshikimura and I had a, a solution for reconnection um, under just a pure imagining that the two are driven together by a, by a straining flow imposed. Um, then we can get them to reconnect, yes, uh, under the effect of diffusion. So there is an explicit solution. Um, but it's... it's um, it's a linearized model. Uh, it neglects what you might think of as being absolutely fundamental as, say, vortex-vortex interaction. Um, but it's two vortices driven together by a rapid strain, and they reconnect by a diffusive process. So yes, to that extent, there is an example. Um, and this is the Hopf link, which does the same thing. I'll show in a moment. But there, here is Navier, and here is Stokes um, uh, of the famous Navier-Stokes equation. This is actually the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation. I used to tell my students in Cambridge yeah, that Navier was responsible for the left-hand side of the equation, and Stokes, <laughs> Stokes uh, for the right-hand side. But <laughs> um, uh, when you take the curl, it's just the o omega, the curl of u, 
the omega identity is the curl of u cross omega plus the diffusion term. And when I say a linearized version, it neglected this term, just took diffusion, but imposed a velocity, imposed a given straining velocity to bring the vortices together. And on that basis, yes, we can uh, see explicitly a, a reconnection. Perhaps in, uh, in a later lecture, I'll, I'll show the, uh, the detail of that. Um, so, Oh, here it is. There's uh, the the hop flink evolving, and again, what happens is is rather similar. Um, two rings initially linked. Obviously, they want to propagate. Each one wants to propagate along its own natural direction, and they're bound to they're bound to um, they're bound to collide, as it were, with each other. Yeah. So I do it. Yes, to to create the the hop link, it's very clever actually. And I should have mentioned it with the um, even for the trefoil. Um, for the tre let me say the trefoil first. You take what amounts to like an airplane wing, a long airplane wing, which has a sharp trailing edge and a rounded front. It's got to be like that. And you imagine tying that in a trefoil knot, and they create they make that sort of thing using a three D printer. Three D printer. So you feed in the equation of the surface that you're wanting. 3D printer creates this thing for you, and then you jerk it into motion in water, and you can generate the trefoil. Now, the trefoil that you generate is actually linked with the, the solid surface that you've done it with. But there again, they, they cut out little sort of notches in the surface so that the ring that is generated can propagate and reassemble itself free of the, of the generating device. The, now, the, the hop link, you do the same. You just take two, um, two linked solid airfoils, <laughs> as it were, um, and they're, they're mounted in some clever way by thin rods. So, on. so you've got the two, and they're there. it's jerked into motion, generates, and again, they've got to cross the solid surface. So the whole thing is, is really quite ingenious, but that's how it's done. Um, okay. So I, I just showed you this um, this equation here, and one term representing the convection or the transport of the vorticity field, and the other one representing diffusion, which can change the topology. And both processes are important, and as we've seen, Im equally important in in biology, where this is replaced by the action of the what is it, the recombinase or the <laughs> um, whatever. Um, okay, some notation. Um, the fluid uh, velocity u is a vector function of position x and time t, and we're in three dimensions always. Uh, and uh, well, in turbulence, it's a random function of position and time. It could be a laminar flow, and equally, then it's not random; it's well defined. The vorticity, the curl of this uh, velocity. This is where I say I think this notation, um, it was familiar to Maxwell, and it became popular later in the 19th century. Um, so this is the curl. You can use a multiplication sign there if you prefer, or just this wedge product. And um, then what we're going to be very much concerned with is the helicity. The helicity is the correlation between the velocity field and uh, the associated vorticity field. Uh, it may, I'm thinking in terms of turbulence here, but if it was, um, say, a single vortex or a knotted vortex uh, of localized extent, then you take an integral rather than an, an average. The integral of the scalar product of u and omega with respect to volume element. So I've called it here the correlation. It's um, a pseudo scalar quantity. Um, I say, think of a box of screws. Um, you take a box of all containing right handed screws, half filled, closed box, you shake it vigorously. Then these screws point in random directions and they're uniformly distributed throughout the box. So you have a vector field in that box that is homogeneous. In other words, it doesn't depend on space, like air in the room. Uh, it's isotropic because they're randomly distributed. But nevertheless, they're all right-handed. So they have helicity. So you can have a random field that is 
isotropic, homogeneous, but nevertheless is uh, not reflection symmetric. It's chiral. And the simplest measure of chirality is helicity. Um, so it's a pseudoscalar. And the flow is, we'll say, right-handed if this helicity is positive, left-handed if it's negative. Um, and uh, saying this is it's conventional to use a right-handed coordinate system. So helicity right-handed in a right-handed coordinate system. Um, the thing is here, u velocity is a pure vector, whereas the curl of velocity, uh, vorticity, is a pseudo vector. The scalar product of the two is a pseudo scalar. It's an invariant, constant in time of the Euler equations of fluid mechanics. Um, I will prove that for you because it's fundamental. Uh, you c in that sense, you can compare it to an energy as an invariant of the Euler equations, uh, known since uh, Euler himself. But this uh, helicity invariant, well, it was first actually found by Jean-Jacques Moreau in 1961, paper published in the French uh, Compte Rendu. Um, and it's a, a measure of the conserved degree of knottedness, I call it, or linkage of tangled vortex lines, and therefore top certainly topological in character. And I... Um, wrote my paper on this in 1969. I, I wasn't aware of Morrow's paper until quite a bit later, till about 1978. And um, so really it was, an, and I came at, uh, at this in, a, in, a, in quite an independent way, so I will explain that. But anyway, this helicity, I think, is just the sort of thing that Kelvin would have wanted but he missed out on it somehow. I mean, he was concerned with topology. He was concerned with knotted vortices. He wanted them to be stable, of course. He wanted all sorts of things which didn't turn out to be the case. But now I want to tell you, before I take to the blackboard on this, um, why helicity is so important in fluid mechanics. It's important for two different reasons. Firstly, it's important because of... Um, its relevance to dynamo theory. Uh, I show you here the Earth's magnetic field. This is not velocity field, but here is the, uh, the, co we, the Earth. We're out here on the surface, and there's the... Um, no, <laughs> this is actually the liquid core. The surface is much further out, I'm sorry. This is the liquid core, and this is the solid inner core. And in this liquid region, you have convective flow convective motion, very much influenced by the Coriolis, uh, by the fact that the Earth is rotating. So you've got, <coughs> you've got the basic rotation vector of the Earth, capital omega, call it, and you've got gravity, G, which um, is uh, directed, of course, towards the center, <coughs> and you've got the pseudo-scalar product, G dot omega, which imprints itself on the flow in this region and gives the flow helicity, which is actually anti-symmetric about the equatorial plane. <coughs> I have it um, positive in the northern hemisphere, negative in the southern hemisphere. The magnetic field lines look something like this. Now, this is from a numerical computation of the, the dynamo process for the Earth. And the field lines are roughly nice, well-behaved away out here, like a dipole, like the dipole that we're all familiar with. But if you follow field lines down into the central, the <coughs> core region, the liquid core, then they become extremely complicated, extremely complicated topology. So you follow a field line down here, it follows a more or less random path. It will emerge here. You've come around again, but it'll be a different field line now. You come in again, random path again, and out, and so on. <coughs> and uh, it will actually never close on itself. So that magnetic field is generated by liquid flow in the core, and it is the non-zero helicity that is responsible for the generation of that magnetic field. That's why it's important. And in this context, helicity was the breakthrough in the 1960s. Uh, because there is an associated effect 
It's called the alpha effect, whereby when you start taking averages over the, over the random field, and this is something you must want to do in biology as well, when you've got extremely complicated situations, as we heard this morning, you're somehow going at some stage to have to average over um, the very small scale um, fluctuations. Uh, anyway, when you average in this context, <coughs> an average current <coughs> appears which is proportional to the average magnetic field and the proportionality uh, constant is alpha uh, as introduced by uh, Steinbeck, Krauss and Redler, Potsdam in uh, the old DDR in 1966. An amazing result really um, because again it turns out to have an enormously simplifying effect in the whole of dynamo theory. And it's when dynamo theory really began to take off. So I say a G dot omega is non-zero, and this is the reason for it. It gives rise to the helicity. Helicity uh, positive, if you have a magnetic line of force and a rising fluid element, and it's also rotating, so omega and U correlated, then it will lift the line of force and twist it round to give you a sort of omega shape. And uh, a magnetic field loop that looks like this is usually associated with a current. It's like a little bit of a solenoid, um, a current flowing. So that's the current antiparallel, in this case, to the uh, magnetic field. If you have a random superposition of this sort of thing going on all over the place, then <coughs> this is the mean effect that is generated. Well, um, the statement is this, the amazing result. If H is non-zero in a sufficient expanse, <coughs> it's very important, of electrically conducting fluid in turbulent motion, then a large-scale magnetic field will grow spontaneously from an infinitesimal level. And a large-scale magnetic field emerging is order emerging out of the small-scale chaos that's associated with turbulence. So it's absolutely dramatic. It explains, I mean, you need the helicity, you need large enough scale, you need turbulence with helicity at small scale. Given that, <coughs> then a large scale coherent magnetic field will grow. And this uh, applies not only in the Earth and other planets, <coughs> but in astrophysics in stars and even in galaxies. Uh, the same dynamo mechanism <coughs> operates in all self-gravitating, rotating celestial bodies with conducting fluid interiors. Most other planets and the sun, stars and galaxies. <coughs> Fully ionized gas or plasma in the controlled fusion context also. These are pictures of the sun and the solar magnetic field, just to give you an idea of the context. And here's some great, great erupting loop from the surface of the sun. This is more um, an artist's image, but it's based on numerical computation of the surface magnetic field of a young star. Um, it's uh, Zeeman Doppler imaging plus a bit of creative uh, processing. Um, and uh, this is our own galaxy, the Milky Way, in which you have a strong magnetic field in the disk of the Milky Way and a rather weaker magnetic field um, in the halo outside. And uh, these are a couple of spiral galaxies in which there's very strong, coherent, large-scale magnetic field believed to be generated by the same type of dynamo action. I mean, you obviously have a rotation of the galaxy, which is responsible for the formation of spiral arms and you have a gravitational field towards the plane of the disk and partly towards the center. There's this sort of statement that you encounter in the literature. What caused many of the details in this and similar Planck maps and how magnetism in general affected our galaxy's evolution will likely remain topics of research for years to come. Well, that's absolutely true. Okay, um, well, I'm going to take to the blackboard now. i just uh, show you this uh, because I have <coughs> made, written some lecture notes which would be too small to read, I think. Um, 
<coughs> I, I hesitate to put them on the web because they're still evolving. Um, and I wonder if, if, I, I, if I could be, if you s uh, one of the organizers could send me an email with all the addre email addresses of you all, then I'll be happy to send, you can do that. Then I'll send an email, I'll send um, th these notes by email t so that you, you, you get them all. You'll see what I mean because um, it's, um, it's too much to go through this sort of detail. Now just to extract the, um, but I these are sort of notes that, uh, that, uh, that I have and uh, that's a laboratory and that's a little poem about, um, which is probably all you'll remember of this lecture. <laughs> um, but it's an important bit of poet poetic uh, license. A convection and diffusion and turbulence with helicity yields order from confusion in cosmic electricity. That is the essence of this, this lecture. I just uh, want in the remaining time to give you the idea of the how to prove um, the invariance of helicity. And I'll do it for a magnetic field. Magnetic field B, Xt, in a perfectly conducting fluid. Now from Maxwell's equations, in a perfectly conducting fluid, you can derive the equation for a magnetic field. It's equal to the curl of the velocity crossed with B. Now, I if you're very much from the pure mathematical side, you will prefer this notation. You'll prefer a, a curly L. A curly L and a little u here and a b here. Because it is what is known as the Lie derivative. It's the Lie derivative r with respect to the flow, the flow u. Lie derivative of b. And it simply conveys the fact that the field B is transported by the flow. This is transported in a very particular way. It is such that the flux of B across any little element of fluid, I take an element here and there's a magnetic field threading that element. The element moves to some something else. The flux of B through that element is conserved. And that is the property that is conveyed by that equation. So no matter what. Now, um, there's an alternative way to write that same equation in Lagrangian form. And this is appropriate. <coughs> or if you like, material form. And I'll write it with a capital B. dB by dt, and it's equal to B dot grad u. That is the same. It's quite equivalent to this equation. But the capital D by dt is the Lagrangian or material derivative. It's partial D by dt plus u dot grad. And I should say right up here that I'm going to assume, assume that divergence of u is equal to zero. It's not absolutely essential. Uh, one can weaken this, but this is, in other words, we're considering volume-preserving flows. Volume-preserving. And uh, the B itself always satisfies that equation. Uh, it's not an assumption, it's a statement. <laughs> Div B is equal to zero. Magnetic poles do not exist. So that's the Lagrangian form of the same equation. And that is the same equation as is satisfied by a little line element, that uh, material line element that may be carried with the flow. So it's that equation that tells you that the B lines, I like the phrase B lines for a line of force, because we use, you know, we use the term B line. You make a B line for something when you go in a straight line. <laughs> These B lines are the lines of force of the magnetic field. The B lines are frozen in the fluid. Frozen in the fluid. And that's a theorem that was proved by Alfvén in 1942. And uh, <coughs> it, um, 
that together with the discovery of alpine waves is what got him the Nobel Prize. Um, so the B lines are frozen in the fluid. Now, div B equals zero means that there exists a vector potential A such that B is equal to the curl of A. And you can choose the gauge of A so that the divergence of A is equal to zero, but again, that's not necessary. And if I uncurl this equation, B is curl A. We've got a curl here. We'll get an equation for A. A by dt is just U cross B, which is curl A. And because I've removed a curl, you've got to put in a gradient minus the gradient of some scalar field phi. So the curl of that is obviously that. This is the uncurl. And um, this equation can also be put into Lagrangian form. So here we've got Lagrangian form for B, and the Lagrangian form for A, well, D by dt, our writers AI, is equal to, it's not B dot grad, it's something rather different. See, if I put that into bj d by dx j ui in suffix notation, here it's a little bit different. It's aj, and uh, it is d by dx i of uj minus the grad phi. And uh, d phi by dx i. Okay. Now these are the two Lagrangian forms. Now you take a volume of fluid. And I'll call it V with an L on it and a surface S with an L. L equals Lagrangian. In other words, it's a volume that is moving with the fluid, with the velocity field. So the surface is also moving with the velocity field. And you take a boundary condition. You assume that on this boundary with normal n, b dot n is equal to zero on the boundary. So we have a magnetic field inside this volume, maybe knotted, maybe whatever you like, but it is tangential on the boundary. And since the field is frozen in the flow, if it's tangential on the boundary at the initial instant, it remains tangential for all times. All right? Because it's a magnetic surface which moves with the fluid. We call it a magnetic surface. Magnetic surface moving with the fluid. Now we put the two together. The helicity, ah, I haven't even defined it yet, or did I did on a previous slide. The helicity is the integral throughout this volume of A dot B dV. So the rate of change of this helicity is what we're interested in, is the integral throughout the volume of, now we use the Lagrangian form the a by dt dot b plus a dot db by dt. dv. And you can use that um, in that form because um, the um, flow is incompressible. Volume, the volume, when you follow a volume element, its volume remains constant. So it's safe to do that with uh, this dv integration. Um, now, you really do have to use the suffix notation that I have here. So we'll have a bi times this, bi aj d by dx i uj plus, and the other term a dot this one, <coughs> Well, I'll make it aj, bi d by dx i uj, whole thing, 
dv. Oh, and then there's a minus grad phi, which, um, which I didn't include in this. It's a minus bi, b minus a b dot grad phi term, which integrates to zero, so that's why I forgot to put it there. Now everything else, actually, you can turn this into, you see a bi d by dx, div b is zero, so the bi can always come inside. And here, bi d by dx, that can come around here, div b being zero. But then you've got an aj d by dx i of uj, and you've got an uh, um, aj d by dx i, I think maybe you int have to interchange a but what it comes to is an integral over the volume. Well, I'll leave the bi there, but it's d by dx i. It's u dot a. It comes in minus phi dv. That is the net result. <coughs> and that's zero. Well, two more steps. If you want to get to the zero, you put this inside, you use the divergence theorem, you're left with n dot b appearing in the surface integral, but n dot b is zero on the surface. So it's zero. So that is the proof that helicity, we have to latch onto that because helicity tomorrow <laughs> will be related to the Rife plus twist that we've heard about earlier this morning. And this is where you have the bridge, the interesting bridge between fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics on the one hand and topology on the other. Or it's really topology and, and differential geometry gives rise to the constancy of Rife plus twist for a knot. Well, the two things are two sides of the same coin. Okay. <laughs> well, I hope that there may be Enough there for Renzo to get start on the tutorial this afternoon. Um, I haven't covered nearly as much as I hoped I would cover this morning, but that's the way of lectures when you, we'll make up for it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.